morning, Governor Louisa. It's great to be with you and the Rotarians of District 7820 this morning. Before we begin, I want to particularly congratulate the Rotarians of the Rotary Club of Sydney on their centennial celebration. You know, I have a great affinity with Sydney since I was the host, the chair of the, oh no, wait, that's a different Sydney, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a different Sydney. Happens all the time. Uh, all the time. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> that's a pretty bad, pretty bad joke. But anyway, I, it is interesting to note that the Rotary Club of Sydney, Nova Scotia is slightly older than the Rotary Club of Sydney, Australia. The, mm -hmm. um, uh, the Rotary Clubs of Melbourne, and Sydney will celebrate their centennial in the upcoming Rotary year, I believe. I believe. So. That's correct. And, and something you may not know is that it was Rotarians from the Rotary Club of Halifax here in our district who traveled to Australia and helped to start the Rotary Club in Melbourne. The question has to do with how I, we have adapted in this new time. Well, one thing that we've adapted is that last night was the 52nd night in a row, 52nd consecutive night that Gay and I have slept in our own bed. <laughs> and um, just from a personal standpoint, my wife Gay thinks we've never done that before. <laughs> I, I think surely there was some time when our children were small where surely we didn't have a night away, you know, for a month and a half or something, but, but I can't prove it either way. <laughs> but I'm quite confident that no international president in 50, 60, 70 years has had a uh, that many nights, consecutive nights in his own bed, in his own home. Mm -hmm. And so that, that is a, an unusual situation. And, uh, and of course, another adaptation, and it really kind of hits hard, particularly today, uh, Today, May the 7th, Gay and I were to be in Rome and uh, we were scheduled for a private audience with the Pope. Oh. And uh, there has not been a private, you know, Rotary International Presidents have had the opportunity in recent years to greet the Pope at the end of an event or the end of a, a general audience. but. I'm not aware, I mean, I'm confident that through the 80s, since the 80s, there's been none, no private audience. I am aware that past President Roy Hickman from Birmingham, Alabama, I've seen a photograph of him and his wife with Pope Paul VI, which would have been in the, you know, 71, 72, 73. And so it's, uh, that's kind of hitting home today because, because uh, it, was, it was a big deal to have a private audience. You know, Gay and I would have gone into his library or whatever. We would have had the opportunity to have up to 10 people greet the Holy Father before we went into the meeting. And, um, you know, well, it's not happening. Well, that was, yeah, that's certainly a very special thing to, to have missed. That's a, none, of, none of the rest of us can say that for sure. So you've, you've, you've missed out on a, on a lot of things that you had planned. But, you know, it's, uh, you know, the convention, we've had to cancel the convention. But, you know, we, we must remember that it's not Mark Maloney that's been picked on, or it's not Rotary International that's been picked on. We're all in the same boat. The entire world is in the same boat. Um, you know, every other organization is uh, converting to a uh, 
new new way of doing things. They're canceling mass events, uh, you know, even small events like a club centennial, you know, club centennial, what it might not be that small, but um, you know, this, I was to be a few weeks ago at the club centennial of a very small club in Southern Illinois in the area where I was raised. And um, it's just, but my life is now uh, being at home and going to the law office, which is six blocks away. And Gay and I are both attorneys in the same, you know, both partners in the firm. And um, it's a great big office with only six people in it. We've got 10,000 square feet. Uh, 10,000 square feet of uh, space so we can all socially distance ourselves and and between Zoom meetings, I'm practicing law. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's not much time between those Zoom meetings, and and I, I think we're you know we're all we're all learning new ways of of uh, behaving and new learn new ways of working and thinking about what the future will be. And so I know Rotary has a team looking at the future of Rotary, and we're hearing the word pivot will probably be the word of the of the year that we're all learning to use. And I've oh, even heard within Rotary connection is the word of the year. Connection, true, true. Pivot will be number two then. I'll, I'll give you that. Pivot must be number two in terms pivot's, of the frequency. Pivot's a great word. Pivot's a great word. So so what are you what are you seeing when we hear people in, at RI and elsewhere now, we're talking about hard pivot even, not just pivot, but a hard pivot. What, what, what does that mean for you in terms of what we should be thinking about for Rotary in the future? Well, um, I think it means more innovation and flexibility. You know, we have, we've always resisted online meetings. I mean, club, there are e-clubs that have certainly met online, but uh, generally speaking, clubs have resisted online events. You know, there's only a handful of clubs around the world who live stream their, their meetings. And, you know, I was just on the, on a Zoom call yesterday with my own club president and president-elect. And, uh, you know, we're a 91-year-old club, been around for a long time, and they're talking about, you know, we're, gonna, we're probably going to make the investment in the equipment so that once we get back to in-person meetings, that we can live stream the meeting to those who can't be there mm -hmm. and uh, to, to make it accessible. And, and, you know, and I think clubs ought to be you know, every speaker that they have, they ought to keep that speaker's uh, email address and send that speaker a notice to where they can, you know, come view, a, you know, even if they don't attend the meeting, they can come see a speaker in the future. And making those connections, there's that word again, making those connections to, to grow Rotary. And, but, you know, it's, I'm not really sure that he said this, but I've heard somebody say that Winston Churchill said, never waste a good crisis. And, and of course, there's the other saying that necessity is the mother of invention. We have started doing these things because we have to. And we realize that we should have been doing them all along. I'm not saying have only virtual meetings, but... Um, you know, you can have a meeting of the Rotary International Board of Directors virtually. Now, I'm not, you know, you can't have a meeting that lasts eight hours a day because you're gonna go into the middle of the night or start in the middle of the night, you know, someplace. And, but, you know, we can meet for three hours a day at a fairly reasonable time for every member of the board of directors. And two weeks ago, we did that. And I mean, finally on the last day, we had to meet five hours and the four, the four directors in the Philippines and, and Japan and Korea were up until two and three o'clock in the morning. But, um, but you know, we had, we had people, I counted at least 19 countries that we had people in counting the directors elect we were operating in seven languages and we had 66 participants, including staff and interpreters 
on on the Zoom call, and I was, you know, running this meeting, not from the technology side, but from the presiding side, from right where I'm sitting right now, in the living room of my home. And, you know, there were people, interpreters all over the Chicago land area, interpreting in, in those other languages, those six other languages. And the, you know, the secretary to the board was in his home, in in Chicago, and it it works. Now it's you don't want to meet that way all the time, and but we now realize that if we've got an issue that needs more urgent attention, you know, it, once we get back to where we can meet regularly in large groups with you know without in person, we can now have you know, meetings, intervening meetings to address specific issues and committee meetings in particular. It's not necessary that we always bring everybody to Chicago and that will be a tremendous savings to Rotary. I mean, you know, we're going to have, you know, this year, uh, the savings on travel are going to be significant, you know, Absolutely. through yeah. 30th huge shift in in that whole area and um, this particular district has done it quite a few things differently this year we didn't do automatic club visits right off the top we've uh, been putting a lot of focus on helping clubs to connect now with providing zoom licenses and we've just purchased new banners for all clubs to help them reintroduce themselves to their communities when we are able to to get out and do more things but i'm wondering if we if we think about the number of people in our audience this morning who are incoming club and district leaders do you have two or three key pieces of advice that those folks should be keeping in mind as they think about the the next rotary year and how they will be well prepared for the the new normal as we're often calling it now well um my i have three single words to um say to them innovate 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 <laughs> um but to be I mean, I, I, I definitely mean that, but to be a little more serious, um, you know, innovation, it's, it's not so much what I think they ought to be doing or what you think they ought to be doing, Louisa. It's they need to be trying lots of different things. We need these Rotary Clubs being laboratories for how things can happen and trying out new and different things and things that don't work, well, we put them aside and try something else, but things that do work, be, share, be sure to share them with the district leadership and that they get passed on like to the club and district support team at Rotary International so that they can be shared with other clubs. But, you know, in my estimation, the three areas that need special attention our engagement, service, and fundraising. And, you know, number one, most important of all of those is engagement. We need to engage Rotarians and, you know, and if you've got, if you're a club that has not yet started meeting virtually, then you need to find a mentor that can help you get started doing that. And it's not hard. It's not hard. Now, you know, for example, in Peru, they've got a lot of little clubs, you know, 15, 20 member clubs in one district. Well, 14 of those clubs are now coming together in a mass virtual meeting so that they can have perhaps more interesting speakers and a more varied program. And I mean, there's lots of ideas like that. So, but, so if you're not meeting virtually, you need to start meeting virtually. And the, and Louise, it's your and your team's responsibility to make sure that they have the resources and the mentorship to get them to do that. If they are meeting, they need to be paying attention to who shows up on that participant list. And the people that aren't there 
they need to be making individual contacts and you know making sure that they're that they're okay do they need any i mean just separate and apart you know i'm not trying to get an attendance percentage up for some you know prize for who has the greatest percentage i'm just saying this is rotary is all about connection as you know as 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 i've been saying all year <clears throat> and it's so important that we make that connection with all of the members of the club and i think by doing that they will recognize how valuable their membership in rotary is and will therefore you know keep their membership in rotary on an ongoing basis so engagement is number one service how do we serve in this environment we've got to you know focus on what's important right now that means mainly focusing on pandemic issues and you know there are ways to serve you know you got to get out of the house some but you can do it in a socially distant and appropriate way and we've got you know and those sorts of projects need to be designed and implemented and finally fundraising and this is the challenging part you know how do you have an online fundraiser i know my wife's rotary club their plan you know they were supposed to have a, a fundraising event next week uh, you know at the end of next week and uh, they've now pushed it off into june and they're going to do it principally online i think there may be a few people at some fixed place but uh, it's going to be basically an online event and you know they've adjusted how the auction is going to go it's going to be some sort of live auction and um you know john hukos you know john huko you may recall is a member of the rotary club in kiev ukraine and he was on oh three weeks ago with rotarians from the ukraine and they had some sort of virtual beer fest Ooh. and you bought virtual beers which seems very dry to me but anyway i don't know how they did it but apparently it was a success and somebody in ukraine ended up with a case of beer on their front porch you know uh, several days later i uh, but you know there's got to be innovative ways to do that i don't have the answers but i think clubs need to just brainstorm in each of those areas to see what they think they can do Right. That's a great one that have a virtual beer fest. I know one of our clubs had a uh, chocolate tasting recently that involved people picking up a little package and doing some things online as part of a social. So there are some creative ways to, to do things online for sure. I just wanted to remind everyone that if you have questions yourself that you would like to pro propose to um, President Mark, please put them in the chat. Holly will be monitoring those and we will have a bit of time for questions to be asked. She'll unmute you when the time comes for for your turn. Uh, President Mark, you were just mentioning you know, different things that are happening in, in different parts of the world. And certainly before this happened, you did have a chance to visit quite a few countries. I don't know how many, if you kept track or not, but can you tell us a little bit about how does Rotary vary from one part of the world to another? We often hear people talk about you know, what's happening in Asia where numbers are increasing, what's happening in other parts of the world. Can you speak to what some of your observations were to how Rotary looks around the world? sure and i can tell you precisely how many countries since my nomination i've been to 30 30 countries wow and that's low that is low for a president um you know barry in barry rasson my predecessor in a year and a half or two years he went to 60 countries and i would i would have had another i don't know 10 or something like that mm -hmm. but um i although it seemed like i was traveling a tremendous amount i was not traveling quite as much as my immediate predecessors barry rasn and ian risley mm -hmm. and um and of course part of that is U.S. tax laws, they got, they, if they spend too many days in the U.S., they get, start getting taxed as, uh, as a U.S. resident. So they, <laughs> we, you know, they got to go to uh, yeah. get out. And anyway, but that's beside the point. Um, Rotary is very, very different. 
in some parts of the world, it is very formal. In other parts of the world, it is much more casual. Um, the, uh, for example, in Japan, Rotary is extremely formal. We, during the first week of August last in 2019, Gay and I did a visit of uh, an eight day visit to Japan, visiting uh, six different areas. I think we, you know, stayed in, we had seven different hotels over eight nights. And, uh, and so, and when you would, come to a meeting, whether it was, well, this was like, these would be special meetings, you know, dinner events, presidential visit. These were not regular club meetings. I mean, we did do some regular club meetings and they were a little bit different, but typically if the meeting starts at six o'clock and they do run it kind of on the early side, like we do here in Alabama, if it starts at six o'clock, everybody is in the room at six o'clock and the doors are closed and Gay and I, you know, kind of walk up along with our aides and the governor, or whoever the host is at five minutes of six and the doors are closed and you can hear announcements in Japanese going on inside and, and, you know, there's the key, kaicho is the word for president. <laughs> and, um, and all of a sudden they introduce us, they swing the doors open, a spotlight comes to shine. And first our aide walks up and bows, and then we would walk up and bow and walk in. And, and everyone's already seated at their tables there'd be, you know, music as we walk in, everybody's standing up to applaud. And then the program would be, you know, with dinner would be two to two and a half hours. And essentially nobody leaves during that time. And there's no, you know, like we weren't out in the foyer beforehand greeting people casually. So during the dinner, people come up to greet us. You know, some places they would never come to the president's table. There are other times, you know, you could meet them before, after dinner, before. Well, in Japan, they come up to greet you during the dinner. And you're sitting at a large table in the center of the room, directly in front of the stage. But your back is to the stage because you're the principal person. You get to see the entire crowd who is there to greet you. And and so it's very formal. In, in Guatemala, and moving more on the service side, in Guatemala, Rotary in some places is the social safety net. It's not the government, it's Rotary. Um, there's one city called Sampango, Guatemala, and it has been adopted by one or more Rotary clubs and in, in to a certain extent. And I'm not talking about a small village, I'm talking about a city. And they have, they are providing clean water in the schools. They're providing water and sanitation uh, education in the schools. They have an, a, a nutrition program with the mechanical cow where they're making uh, soy milk from soybeans, then, you know, and so it's a nutrition program for, for the youngest children. Then they take the residue from that, which is this paste that can then be used to make baked goods. And so they have a group of women that are taking this and, you know, an economic development project for them. And then there's childcare and just, you know, and, and you realize that if it were not for Rotary, the quality of life in this city would be at a much lower level. You know, here in the United States and Canada, we expect 
all of those things, you know, water in the schools and, and health education training, nutrition programs. Um, <coughs> excuse me, economic development. We expect that all to be provided by the government. And in most cases it is. I mean, there's differing opinions about how well we do it or do we do enough, but basically something is provided there. Well, um, you know, in, in some of the, in many countries, Rotary is providing that basic level. In India, I cannot tell you how many hospitals, now I'm not talking about huge complexes, but how many hospitals have been built by Rotarians and are um, actively operated by trusts that Rotary clubs have. And in a lot of cases, these are specialty hospitals, uh, I, particularly eye hospitals. I'm sorry, you know, you've punched my button, Louisa, and I can just keep going. No, 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 it's great. It's interesting to hear. And I wanted to just tell you that, that this district has had quite an involvement with uh, Guatemala. I'm glad you used that as an example. So we've got, uh, we've had grant uh, relationships and other relationships for the mechanical cow and, uh, and have seen quite a bit of that. So that's a great example. But it, it's interesting to hear how different the role of Rotary is in communities in different parts of the world. So thank you for sharing that. One of the phrases that you've used a lot this year and that has become a bit of a, a mantra in addition to connection, I think is grow rotary. And yeah. that obviously is going to look a little different now. Um, what, what, what's your thinking around what grow rotary should mean to us as we look ahead for the next however many months we can look ahead? Well, grow rotary, I mean, I will admit that grow rotary is mainly focused on increasing our membership. But we need to grow Rotary in many ways. We need to grow our service. We need to grow the impact of our projects. But mainly, we need to grow the number of people who are performing service. And we've got to change the way that we look at that. Frankly, with this dark cloud of the pandemic, that's hovering over us. I think a silver lining and one of the advantages that we must take advantage of, you know, if you if, if, never, never waste a good crisis, is we are now meeting in a way that is going to be appealing to an entirely different demographic. And we need to find ways to market that to let people know that, that this opportunity is available, that you don't have to meet, you don't have to join a Rotary Club in, that meets in a traditional way, that there can be different types of Rotary Clubs. And of course, my main emphasis, if Rotary is going to grow in areas where Rotary is if you will, mature, like the United States and Canada, most of North America, it's not going to grow just by increasing membership in our existing clubs. We've got to form new clubs, new, in a, different clubs, not just new clubs, not just more traditional clubs, but in an area where you have a traditional club, we need other clubs that meet in different ways. We need clubs that meet around causes. We need clubs that attract a particular demographic. Uh, you know, just down the road from you all in, in Maine, I think it is, they've, and it's, I think it's in, uh, featured in, uh, is it in the May Rotarian? I think I've seen something about the Rotary Club of New Voices that's uh, Ryla alums. And it's in this month's, Rotarian. And um, then the uh, in Minnesota, they're in the midst, I think they're about to send in the paperwork to charter a Rotary Club focused on human trafficking. Mm -hmm. So one, you know, one club's a particular demographic, another's a particular cause. And 
you know, when you look at a community, you can, you know, the Rotary Club, if there's just one Rotary Club there, it necessarily is not going to be serving all the segments of the community. And just like, um, you know, Coca-Cola has classic Coke and Diet Coke and Cherry Coke and Sprite and whatever else to serve different tastes and different you know, if they were serving, if all their, if Coke was their only product, their sales would be far, far less than what they are now. And we must have multiple products as well in the same community. We need a, you know, second or third Rotary Club. And, you know, if you've got a community where you have a hundred member Rotary Club, these new clubs, they're not going to be hundred member Rotary Clubs. They're going to be 20 to 25 members focusing on a particular cause, or, you know, they may, they may never come together for a meal function, you know, except for a family picnic a couple times a year. They just, they plan their service and they go out and serve. You know, a club that does all of its organization online and then comes together twice a month for a service project meets all of the requirements in terms of having two meetings a month. And so we must, we've got to change our mindset and say, you know, yes, I know my club, but what other opportunities are there? Right. I noticed one of the most recent new clubs, I think in Australia is called the uh, Social Action Network. They're not even using the word club in their gathering and they're not having any face-to-face -face meetings. It's a fully online one and clearly has that uh, cause-based piece around being involved in social action. Have you seen any other interesting models or versions that, that can just spark some thinking among the folks in our audience? Well, you know, there's the Passport Club where they generally just meet once a month and maybe online, but then they are encouraged to go around and visit other clubs. There are eco clubs uh, that are focusing on environmental issues. Um, let me just step away for just a moment. The light that's shining here, it's on a timer and I let it go off and just to help. I <laughs> okay. All right, maybe while, uh, while you're doing that, I'll just remind people again that we'll have an opportunity maybe after this question, we'll see if there are a few folks and Holly will kind of tap you on the shoulder virtually and uh, either open your microphone for you so that you're able to ask a question after, uh, after President Mark finishes this response about the different types of club models that we're seeing. No, that may even be worse, actually. Oh, well, we know you're there. <laughs> yeah. All right, sorry. This is not a professional studio. That's okay. Yeah, so we're seeing those those cause base and passport ones. And it was interesting to me that this particular new one was not using uh, not using club. They were calling themselves a network, and I think we're seeing more language, interesting language around people being participants in Rotary. Are you seeing that kind of thing uh, extending? I think so, and of course, you know, we've we've got an effort going now where um, we are looking at a, you know, participant-based or non-club-based participant model, I guess is, is the best way it's described, a non-club-based participant model. And we are preparing to launch uh, pilots of this in the Chicago area and the Houston area to have, you know, to have people somehow connect with Rotary, but not be a member of a Rotary Club. And, you know, so we're certainly, I mean, Rotary International is, it's not for lack of trying that our membership has remained stagnant over the last several years. There are lots of efforts going on and we've just got to remember that it's not just a membership campaign 
we've got to have this attitude and change these attitudes on an ongoing basis and just have slow, steady growth. And that, because that's an indication of vibrancy. Exactly. Yep, thank you. Holly, do you have a, a question that maybe we could pop in there at the moment? I do. Uh, Kevin Connors, uh, you are up first. And I've just unmuted you. Well, Kevin, what's your question? I think um, I am um, looking forward to the uh, introduction of uh, Rotaract as um, as full Rotary members. Um, how do you see Rotaract integrating with the present club structure, and um, how does it fit into the Rotary infrastructure right up to the board level? Well, thank you for that question. At this point. You know, we've had this Elevate Rotaract effort, but, you know, Rotaract is a different club type now. It's not a program of Rotary International. It's a different club type. But Rotaract clubs are not part of the governance structure of Rotary International. Rotaract is a different club type that's available for young adults to bring them into the Rotary family and hopefully keep them in the Rotary family until they either, until they become a Rotarian. And we're not doing a very good job of making that last step. Only about one in 20 Rotaractors become a Rotarian. In terms of you know, so they are not part of the governance structure. They don't elect delegates to district conferences. They don't have uh, votes at international conventions. They don't participate in the selection of the district governor, for example. And hopefully they, those will be incentives for them to become Rotarians along with continuing service and fellowship in Rotary clubs. I, we are looking at the board level in having um, advisors to the board. And I do believe that President-elect Holger in implementing that is intending to have a Rotaractor advisor sit in at every board meeting next year. Okay, that's a good answer. Thank you. Holly, do we have another question? Yeah, Duncan Conrad, go ahead. Hi, President Mark. Just um, wondered if you might uh, uh, spend a couple of um, minutes talking about our um, our efforts uh, with regards to polio eradication and how they're uh, uh, being used to uh, uh, to deal with the COVID nineteen situation, and um, and also say a little bit about uh, the importance of us uh, continuing our efforts to. Uh, meet the gate challenge, which is to raise the $50 million this year uh, for their continued match. Yes. Thank you very much, Duncan. And as I'm sure everyone in your district knows, Duncan is a member of the Rotary International Constitution and Bylaws Committee. And you're supposed to smile when I say that, Duncan. I'm smiling. <laughs> <laughs> He just looked at me and says, boy, that's a lot of work, Mark. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, un unfortunately, due to the pandemic and the social distancing that is required due to the pandemic, that polio immunization efforts are suspended for the time being, but they will return. And Rotary's commitment to eradicate polio has certainly not changed. We are still committed to eradicate polio. And the infrastructure that we have helped to create in many countries around the world is making the switch to supporting the pandemic effort. I mean, we have surveillance activities, we have testing capabilities, and all of these are the things that are the plus part of Polio Plus. And, you know, they had a particular impact um, several years ago during the Ebola uh, <coughs> pandemic, <coughs> Ebola epidemic. And 
it was because of that that, for example, Nigeria ended up with only one case of Ebola. Only one case of Ebola because they had um, the infrastructure in place because of polio eradication to be able to monitor the situation when Ebola was raging through West Africa. And we are committed. Um, you know, we, I, I heard that we are $16 million short of reaching the $50 million goal for this year. Um, we are encouraging Rotarians to contribute. Uh, you know, we, we recognize the issues and concerns and a lot of funds have been diverted. We're doing the best we can and hopefully we will achieve that 50 million or not too much short of it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Holly, I saw another one that I think related to uh, granting and foundation things there, I think. Yeah. The next one is actually Ann, Alex Handyside, you're up. Oh. Oh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Alex. Oh, um, yes, President Mark, um, my, my question is regarding um, the presidential themes that come out every year. Um, I mean, they're very inspirational for us Rotarians. My, my concern, though, is, is over the presidential theme pins, which are preaching to the converted and just seem like a um, well, the funds could be better used somewhere else. What, what's your opinion of the presidential theme pins? Well, I, I think the theme pins and some of the themes and the, you know, paraphernalia, I think they are a very valuable team building tool. Uh, I think that people you know, who are part of the team for that year, they look forward to the pin and it helps to develop an esprit de corps. And I think it has, I think it has some positive impact. It's, you know, those people who are not, who think pins, that the resources could be used for something else. Well, then I encourage them not to spend the money on pins and, and to do it in a different way. I mean, no one, you know, the amount that Rotary International itself spends on pins is, I mean, I, is a, a fairly small amount. Um, you know, I give out pins. There's pins that people come back, you know, who come by my office. Um, you know, it's not like we have millions of pins. Most of the pins are purchased by uh, districts or clubs for distribution. And then it's up to each, you know, up to each club or Rotarian to decide whether they think that's an appropriate use of the resources. Yep, so that's, a tough, that's a tough one, it's a choice one. Okay, uh, Holly, next one. Uh, Brian Smith, go ahead. Good morning, President Mark, and I want to say it's a real thrill to be able to talk directly with Rotary International's president one-on-one. -on -one. Um, can you speak a little bit about Rotary's emergency response to the COVID pandemic, in addition to the Polio Plus connection that you mentioned earlier? Well, all over the world, Rotarians have uh, rallied to the challenge created by the pandemic. And um, clubs, districts all over the world are conducting projects. The trustees of the Rotary Foundation jumped in and put up $3 million to support disaster response grants. In addition, governors have allocated uh, DDF to that. Rotarians have contributed cash. Plus, we've provided Rotarians who were registered for the Honolulu Convention to divert their funding from their, I'm sorry, their uh, registration fees and to put it over to disaster response grants. In terms of disaster response grants and global grants for these sorts of projects, we now have, I think, between six and a half and seven million dollars that has been allocated to these sorts of projects. 
Um, but for example, the Rotarians in Italy alone have spent, have allocated 10 million euros to support projects throughout Italy. Uh, what they've accomplished and what they've been doing in Italy is just phenomenal. And so, you know, and, and Rotarians in Southern California, uh, during the early weeks of the shutdown, they went to some ballrooms, hotel ballrooms, big ballrooms that weren't being used for any meetings. And they set up tables very spaced out and they manufactured 30,000 of the plastic face shields for use by local uh, front line. And there's examples all over the world. Hmm. Yeah, those have been great to see. Wonderful to see the variety of ways and certainly the, the telethon on the weekend was was very well done as well. I participated in that and uh, and thought that was a terrific initiative to have happen. Holly, do we have anything else at the moment? Just one more. Uh, Bob Muffet, go ahead. Unmute. I don't. Hey, Bob, um, you are unmuted. Something's not working right, I think, Bob, because there, no? I it, think you've unmuted me instead of Bob Moffitt. Oh. oh, there, he's unmuted now. President Mark? <laughs> yes, sir. Um, just pass this to Governor Bob Moffitt here. Mark, I think it's important to have uh, new forms of clubs, like passport clubs and clause clubs. But there's still the requirement of bylaws, district dues, RI dues. Uh, are, is there any um, work being done to make it simpler for people that just want to join Rotary for service and have less bureaucracy? Well, there's the, uh, the non-club-based participant model that I talked about would basically, you would engage online. You would, uh, the, the model that's being worked on was that you would connect online and then you would be you know, connected with some Rotarian mentor and, and just, you know, then you're not really part, you're not specifically part of a Rotary Club. And so there, that is a model that's being piloted in Chicago and Houston. I look forward to hearing more about that one, President Mark. Thank you. I, I do too. <laughs> So, so just on that uh, on that theme, the the future of Rotary Committee that's underway. I'm not sure if it's called a committee or task force or what it is. Can you speak a little bit to to what that group is is doing and whether or not their work has now been accelerated with these shifts? Well, there are two groups. Um, the there's the Shaping Rotary's Future Committee. And in fact, they just had a Zoom meeting last night for 90 minutes. Um, and they are looking at governance structure, how we operate, should there be more regionalization? And they're looking at making recommendations to the board. You know, they, they were supposed to make a big report in April and they decided to push it off to an in-person meeting well, of course, now we're not going to meet in person through the rest of 2020. And, um, and so I think, you know, in the coming months, there'll be a report, even though it'll be a virtual, I mean, there'll be a, a full set of recommendations, even though it's a virtual meeting. They're looking at kind of long-term issues. But at this last meeting, uh, the board approved the appointment of a pande pandemic response task force. Mm -hmm. which is a group of nine uh, Rotarians and Rotaractors. And uh, Holger and I were charged with appointing these. And just earlier this week, Holger and I have reached agreement on, on who we're going to ask to serve. And this is a short-term, immediate task force to say, all right, we're in this virtual world. How do we take advantage of it? How do we move things along? How do we grow Rotary with this? And and we're looking at, you know, hopefully lots of innovation there. And we've got, uh, it's not just the same old faces on this committee. Uh, we've got at least one Rotaractor. I've got a very young Rotarian from uh, Guatemala who I recommended for membership. 
uh, you know, two directors nominee who, you know, are not new faces because they're directors nominee, but they're the future of, of uh, rotary leadership and, you know, men and women from around the globe. Great. Well, we'll look forward to that. I know they're, they're, they're on a short timeline, so it will be really wonderful to hear what, uh, what they come yes. up with. Holly, do we have another one there, I think? Okay, one more question. Um, Mark Brown, go ahead. You hear me okay? Yes. Lisa, I want, first I want to say thank you to you for, for this opportunity. It's amazing to see 91 Rotarians from around District 7820 online and discussing topics that are important to, uh, to Rotary in, in our part of the world. All right, President Mark, I'm curious as, whether, as to whether or not there's been um, any recent discussion about where Rotary sees the next focus uh, after polio is eradicated or as polio gets further down the line and, and we don't need to put as much money into eradication and maintenance uh, as we do in the, the currently. Well, there's always lots of discussion on the side and many, many Rotarians have many, many ideas about what Rotary's next cause should be. However, the official policy of Rotary International is that Ro Rotary International will not begin considering whether to have a corporate project and what the corporate project will be until we have completed one year with no polio cases. Now, you know, it, it takes three years with no polio cases and no environmental samples to certify the eradication. But we figure that if we get to the point of one year with no polio cases, then we can start looking forward. So that's, that's the official position. And so there are no official uh, meetings or deliberations regarding about what might come down the road. 